Please welcome James Bond. Welcome, James. This is interesting. So that all access feel, did you genuinely get to a point where you thought, I forgot that they were there, and is that the danger? No, I, I, they were, the cameras followed me for about 18 months on the ah. tour, um, pretty much everywhere, um, you know, at home, without seeing the, too much of the family. And, no, I always could feel their presence <laughs> because we were giving them so much access. What's weird is watching it back. You never really come across the way you'd hoped. I'd hoped to come across as a kind of English musical version of Tom Cruise. <laughs> in, instead, I've really come across as Alan Partridge. <laughs> Uh, so painful for me to watch, but entertaining for but other people. But you sort of... Cos the guy... I read a very funny article at, at the weekend by Chris Atkins, the director, that yeah. you asked to, to do it, and you did sort of say to him, you can do whatever you want, didn't you? Cos he was worried yeah. you were going to try and control it. Totally, and I think if you're going to give access to someone, you know, like mm. that, and they're going to follow you around, you give them full access and see what happens and hope they'll allow you to cut bits off, uh, <laughs> edit towards the end. Um, and, you know, we, and we, had, we showed them everything. And, and, our, and it's a different documentary from most because, you know, there are, some of them are quite serious documentaries about how the hard life it is as a musician. Mm. We're having a blast yeah. on tour. And so, as my crew describe it, it's kind of like a stag dude gone wrong on the road. <laughs> that's, that's what you're watching. Um, I just want to know, why do you think it is that people had... The, the, the press or the media had this... such a harsh treatment of you for putting you down so much to the point where you flipped it in a good way to say, you know what, I'm going to make the, the brunt of myself and be the brunt of my own jokes. Yeah. Uh, well, you know what, my song, You're Beautiful, was, was overplayed, you know, and eventually we all tired of it and needed <laughs> something, <laughs> something new and I get that. And, you know, and if you have great visibility, you'll get great, you know, you'll get some kickback on that. I suppose what's weird, though, is we gravitate towards negativity a little bit, mm. don't we? And so you'll go, oh, look, there's some negative tweets and you guys all know this. Yes. But Actually, the positives in my, in my job far outweigh that. And so I'm asked in interviews, hey, how do you feel about this negativity? And you go, but there are thousands of people queuing up outside. Why aren't we talking about the thousands yeah. of positives yeah. that far outweigh the two, you know, blokes in their 50s uh, tweeting something negative online? Yeah. What, what, it's, in saying that, though, obviously the surname being Blunt, <coughs> you are Blunt, <laughs> right? And, and you snap back. I call you the snapback king, right? And just what makes you in that moment respond? Because a lot of us, like you said, we understand, and it is about the positiveness, and sometimes you feel like, oh, you want to reply and we don't, and you do, but what makes you think, you know what, let me just give you some heat? Well, you know what, but to begin with, in, in interviews, I never had the chance to reply. You know, right. journalists would say whatever they said, and you don't get a, a, a chance. And then they invented Twitter, and my record label said, hey, well, you can use this to, you know, to promote your music. And I thought, well, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, I'm just going to, I'm just going to start, you know, just replying. But rather than getting upset, I just thought, let's, let's talk to people as if you were having a, you know, chat in a pub, mm. a bit of banter in the pub, and, and do it with love and humour. The self-deprecating. Yeah, thing, and so I never that. really, you know, I never do it with emotion, and if you do feel emotion, it's worth just stepping back and coming back and saying, what would I say to my mate right. in this scenario? Yeah. yeah. And it's very... Um, another thing that your director said was that you... When he tries to get you to be serious, you would quite often use humour to deflect. Do you struggle with being serious? Well, with most things, you know, uh, even like emo the, he'd ask some questions and feelings and emotions, you know, as an English man who went to boarding school, I've heard of feelings. <laughs> <laughs> but I've never really felt them. Uh, and so, you know, and I suppose, again, in, in the music business, it's a desperately shallow business, really, and, you know, that's why I enjoy it, because I'm a shallow human being too. But, but, you know, uh, but that kind of... Yeah, I, I don't know, it, it, I just were... I just see now you've done it there. It you fun. see now you are not a shallow human being. <laughs> no, so yeah. you know you had a great God. military career. You were in Kosovo. You saw some terrible, terrible mm. things. Is this? And I like guess a we dealt with it a... there in the yes. same way. We dealt with with seeing the worst of humanity. With dark humour. Uh, with dark humour in yeah. the same way the doctors do. And you know when you're having a tough time in you know in the music business. You, I, I learned to deal with it with humour. Or call up my mates in the army and say, "What are you doing at the moment?" And they'd be in Afghanistan or Iraq, and they'd, they'd say, "So and so has just had his leg blown off," and yeah. that would put things in perspective. Yeah. So you know, so you there's a balance of finding your way around. Yeah. yeah. And it's a... I mean, you obviously have a great deal of confidence because I was reading about when you wanted to get your first record deal. Is this right that you actually arrived at the record company headquarters on a horse in full military uniform? Yeah, well I was I was I was riding I was riding back from work and thought we'll swing by the record oh. label <laughs> um, and uh, and have a soldier hold the horse. 
I didn't get the deal. Um, <laughs> but yeah, at that stage, you're sort of trying anything. I was, you know, really naive trying to get a record deal. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, maybe that works in your benefit in that you're just so positive that one day you will make it. But at the same time, that naivety is, is not cool. You know, I set out with the dream of being a rock star. Didn't really pan out that way. I ended up just being a pop star instead. Well, you um, say just being a pop star, you've sold like over 20 million wow. records. So, I mean, that's, that's not just being a pop star. Let's just put that in place. But this um, One Brit Wonder is the documentary. It's one night only on the 6th of December, isn't it? And you're doing a, a, a sort of a gig after that as well. But of course, this is, we've got an album this year, a tour next year. I know, I'm flogging everything. <laughs> it, must be, it must be Christmas. <laughs> um, and then, and I've just put out a book as well. Exactly. Wow. This, no, this is the best one. Like, possibly the best titled book I've ever read. Loosely based on a made-up story, a non-memoir. It's catchy. <laughs> um, and it, uh, it basically, it's full of stories that you might want to confirm or deny are true, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, well, my lawyer said I had to say it's not true. <laughs> Even though I'll tell between Just you guys, cover. it's uh, 100% true. <laughs> um, and, and so they're really stories I should tell you when we're getting drunk in a pub. Okay. I should all promise not to tell anyone. And then I, and then I put it in a book by mistake. <gasps> And I got an editor, and the editor said, don't self-edit, just put, you know, put everything down, and, and we'll cut out the bad bits when we put it out. And they didn't. They left everything in. <laughs> and it's appalling. And my mother has since called me up and disowned me. <laughs> and my father did call me up before it was uh, published and said, you know, hey, Jimmy, he calls me Jimmy. Um, hey, Jimmy, he's a colonel in the army. Um, you know, maybe you should consider removing some of the drugs and the perversion. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, Dad, I said, Dad, if we do that, there's going to be no book left. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, you're, you're married to the lovely uh, Sophia. Yeah. What would, if she was sitting here and we said to her, what's the most annoying thing about your husband, what would she say? Well, this book, actually. <laughs> she has refused to read it. Um, and that's really a good thing. Will we have any stories? Because, you know, from next year, the next year in February, you're going to be, it's a big 5-0. 4-0. Oh, is it 4-0? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got anything planned? I know you're going to be on tour. But... I will actually be on tour. I'll be playing to, you know, 10,000 of my closest friends in Lille, France. <laughs> um, uh, on the road. Yeah. So you're yeah. ignoring your half a century, are you? Basically. But, you know, uh, the tour is such a fun experience. Mm. It really, it, it's a part... We have an after-party after every single concert. That's what you pick up from the documentary. We're really, really enjoying our jobs. I'm very lucky to do it. And so, if I have a birthday, it is celebrating with a gang on the yeah. road. Yeah. Can't wait to see the documentary. <laughs> just be paid. <laughs> <laughs> James, as always, an absolute delight to see you. One Brit wonder, the documentary. You can only imagine what's going on in there. The memoir is something else. Tour all still to come as well. Ladies and gentlemen, James Blunt. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, guys.